Father, I'm going to hand it over to you. All right. Thanks, Maddie. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm glad that there was a little bit of break between worship and this because I was, uh, I was bawling half the time during worship. Um, I'm sure some of it was the anointing, but I think some of it also was just this um, <clears throat> almost as if I was my, my heart was re knitting to all of you and the sound of each one of your voices and the songs. Uh, this is going to sound, I don't know. You just have to live with me here for a minute, but I felt like my heart was getting knit back together a little bit. Um, while you were all singing. So uh, I felt the Lord really close and I felt you all very close and I felt very close to you. So um, <clears throat> really glad we're together, even though it's not the way we'd like to, but uh, I still feel it. Like I can still experience your hearts. Um, the closeness that we have with each other is real. And uh, I was reminded of it in the last hour that uh, we really are a family. We really are <clears throat> bound in the blood like uh, Joel and Dia sang about, um, as Lauren sang about a unified bride. Oh, there's just so many things that was being touched. Um, but I'm very thankful, very thankful for you, very thankful to the Lord who keeps us together, even when we're physically apart, even when we're isolated physically, we are together. So I'm really thankful for this time together. Glad that you guys made time for us to all be here. I wanted to start out with a psalm that has been bringing courage and comfort to my heart. I uh, want to, if you, if you have your Bibles close by, uh, feel free to open this up. It's Psalm 138. I read this to our core leaders a couple weeks ago. I want to read this to us all today, and I want us to take both courage and comfort. If you have courage, you're comforted. Uh, you don't always have courage when you're comforted, but you're always comforted when you have courage. And I feel like this really gave me courage. Psalm 138. I'm going to read it from the Passion Translation. Uh, the NAS is really strong too, but there's a couple key descriptors that Brian and his translators uh, changed here that I thought were really helpful. Psalm 138, it says, I thank you, I better put my glasses on. I thank you, Lord, and with all the passion of my heart, I worship you in the presence of angels. Heaven's mighty ones will hear my voice as I sing my loving praise to you. I don't know about anybody else, but I've had plenty of time in the last five to six weeks. I've still been working really hard and very busy uh, with a lot of projects I've been working on personally, but I've been able to do verse one. I've been able to worship with all the passion of my heart. And I've, I've felt angelic presence. I've felt the heavenly as close as the natural. And uh, my praise, I know, was heard by the Lord. Verse 1 has been really, uh, I've been living verse 1. Verse 2, Psalm 138, I bow down before your divine presence, and I bring you my deepest worship. As I experience your tender love and your living truth, for the promises of your word and the fame of your name have been magnified above all else. Lord, I ask that now right here while we're all gathered, that the promises of your word and the fame of your name not only have been, but will be and continue to be magnified above everything else, above news, above theories, above politics, I thank you, Lord, that the promises of your word and the fame of your name will be magnified above all else. Verse 3, at the very moment, please take comfort and courage in this, at the very moment I called out to you, you answered me. This is so important, and I ask that we all would just 
be reminded together that in the moment we call out to the Lord, he answers us, not just hears us, not just like, oh, okay, I'll get back to you. No, he answers us at the very moment we call to him. And this is how he answers us, not with, hey, he's going to do what we say. Hey, he's going to change these things that need change. Look at what he does. This is how he answers when I call out to him. He strengthens me deep within my soul and breathes fresh courage into me. So when I call out to the Lord, when I, when I stretch out my voice in worship and in prayer, what immediately takes place is as my heart turns to heaven, heaven infuses itself into me. The very king and his kingdom are breathed into me and my soul is strengthened and courage is breathed into who I am. May that be so for you. Verse 4. One day all the kings of the earth. Man, do we need this right now. One day all the kings of the earth will rise to give you thanks when they hear the living words that I have heard you speak. You see, we get to be privy to the words the Lord speaks before the rest of the earth gets to hear it. We are his sons and daughters, and his family hears what he says before the rest of the earth. Even the kings, presidents, leaders, uh, people of science, people of uh, any kind of media control, we hear what the Lord is saying before they do. But one day it says, all the kings of the earth will rise to give thanks not just hear his living words, but will rise in worship and in praise, thankful that they now hear the words we've been hearing. We have faith. I believe this with all of my heart, that this, this time that we're in is turning the hearts of kings to the Lord because they're running out of answers. They're hearing different opinions and none of it is working. None of it's bringing peace. None of it's bringing the resolution that they want and they need for their countries, for their nations, for their peoples. And what's happening is people are, kings of the earth are turning to hear what we've been hearing. And they're going to give thanks when they hear these words. They too, verse five, will sing of your wonderful ways <laughs> for the ineffable, your ineffable glory is great. They're not going to be, have anything else to do. They're, they won't be able to think of anything else, say anything else, because they're going to sing. They're going to see the glory of the Lord. This tangible, I can't help but notice now, this king and his kingdom. And I will sing with all of these ones. Verse 6. For though you are lofty and exalted, you stoop to embrace the lowly. I've prayed this many times, verse 6, that the Lord would stoop and touch those who are suffering right now. Those who are in fear, those who are physically ill because of this virus, those who are afraid of being physically ill because of this virus. I believe the Lord is stooping low to embrace people. Though he is lofty, though he is full and exalted and filling the whole universe, he is stooping to embrace the lowly. But he it says he keeps his distance from those who are filled with pride. And I've, I've asked the Lord because of this psalm, I've asked the Lord that, man, I don't want anything in my life to actually keep the Lord at a distance. So, and I'm, I'm just asking this for all of us right now. Lord, if there is anything in us as a family that, that, that fills us with arrogance or with pride, that we think we don't need you, that we think that we can carry on without you, do this life without you, Lord, I ask that you would, as we worship you, as that loving truth fills us, that you would drive that out of us and draw near because we need you. Seven, by your mighty power, I can walk through any devastation. Right now, by the power of God, we can walk through this time. We can. And not only will we walk through this time, but he will keep us alive and revive us. I speak that over every person here on this call, and I really want to speak it over the whole earth. You will be kept alive by the Lord. 
it, trust in his power, sing of his words, sing the words that you hear, turn your heart to the Lord. He will keep you alive. He will revive you and his power will set us free from the hatred of any enemy. Thank you, Lord. Finally, verse eight, you keep every promise you've ever made to me. You keep every promise you've ever made to me. Since your love for me is constant and endless. That's how he's able to keep every promise. His love doesn't turn off. It doesn't ebb and flow. It doesn't wane. It is strong. It is constant. It is decided and it will continue. And as a result, he keeps every promise he's ever made to us. This is why we don't fulfill promises. It's because we ebb and flow with times. We ebb and flow with emotions. We ebb and flow because of circumstances. And as a result, our word changes. But as we turn our hearts and as heaven invades us, we're able to walk in this same way, keeping every promise. And finally, end of verse eight, I ask you, Lord, to finish every good thing that you've begun in me. I want to finish with that today, at least uh, as we start here today, that I'm believing that what the Lord started in each one of you individually what he started in us when we started as a USA koinonia, what he started in Ukraine back in the early 2000s with the Strombecks and with those kids. Father, I thank you that that has not stopped. I thank you, Lord, that you are moving and you are continuing forward, that this love you have for us is constant and the ev every promise you ever spoke to us and through us, through all of this time, you will finish it because you started it. We didn't start this. You did. And so, Lord, we believe you and we trust you. And we ask that you fill us with courage, even in a time like this, that everything you've started, you will finish. Amen? Amen. I love you guys. Um, we're going to stay on this call together. How, is it, how it's going to work is there's 10 of us who kind of have microphones that can talk at any time. Uh, we're just going to kind of go back and forth. I'm going to give this over to Randy here in a moment. He's going to share a little bit of his heart and Steve are together at Randy's house. And then we've got guys like Caleb and Neil and Larry and Chuck and Ben and Sergey from Ukraine. And I probably forgot somebody and please forgive me, but you're all there and I love you. I'm so glad we're together in this way. We're just going to interact, and we want you to interact as well. So if things that are happening on the inside of you as we talk need to come out, uh, let Maddie or Diane know, and uh, we'll make sure we get to hear you. So, hey, Randy, you got some things you want to share with us? Yeah. Can you hear me all right? All good? I think um, I, I usually get stuff for our koinonias. Um, usually it starts like the day after one coin of the uh, and you know, for the six months or three months or however long it takes, he'll, you know, maybe show me some stuff from time to time about things coming up for our next gathering. And so one of the main things he started really talking to me about was this word restoration or restore. So I wrote it down like in uh, November and I started studying it and what it what it meant what it did mean and then Corey and i watched a video of this lady and it really came to life a lot of stuff that this lady said and it caused me to dig deeper and so i went back and i, I looked at the definition of what restore meant and i feel like um this is maybe the track we'll start on we can just go wherever from here the definition is um as to bring back to or put back something to a former or its original state. And then I, when I started looking at that, when we think of restore so many times, we think of, well, I've lost something, God restore it back to me. And we normally think of it in present tense, 
something that I have, like even even money, let's use money as an example. I lost a thousand dollars, restored my thousand dollars back, but that's not really what the root meaning of the word restore is. Restore it back to God's original intent for what I was supposed to have, not what I have. Like his original intent for our marriage, even though we have a really great marriage, we are saying now restore our marriage to what you originally intended it to be, even as good as it is now. Like how much better can it be or what did you plan on it being before the foundations of the earth and certainly before we got married? And I think we have this paradigm shift if we think that way. So it's not just I lost this and now it's replaced. Um, and it goes to relationships. Um, this is really one, one thing that I wanted to kind of key on today was relationships that we've lost. Or we didn't even know we had because we overlooked it. We didn't know the importance or the relevance or the value of the original intent that God had for every relationship we have in our life. That's why it's called koinonia. It's this fellowship that we have together. And if we overlook it, like you talk a lot about, you know, why are we suffering? Because we don't we discern, the discern the body, right? So we haven't accurately seen God's intention for my relationship with you. And I just kind of go, that's Steve Burris. I love him, whatever. You know, we don't see, like we haven't physically seen each other for a long time. <laughs> a long time. And you came driving up the driveway an hour ago and you know, just jumped right into worship with us. Mm -hmm. And so if we don't, understand the value that we have and then be really intentional like okay god what do you have for that relationship not like you're a great guy we love to travel the world and mess around but you know if we don't see each other we feel like we've lost something and god says okay i want to restore it back to what i originally intended you guys to do together and that kind of goes a long way um so i wrote down i wrote down the, a few things it's not, it doesn't mean that we've, we restore what we had before with that person, but he'll restore that original intent of the relationship. And this lady said this one phrase, and I'll kind of expand on it. She said, to give me the friend that I was meant to have. Like if your relationship is broken or something like that, to give me the friend that I was meant to have, not what I already had. And then I further it on, and I heard the Lord say this little phrase to me was, and also make me the friend that I was meant to be. That's like our part in the restoration of relationship was make me, I'm going to, I'm going to allow the Lord to make me into the friend that I was meant to be instead of the friend that I was to you good or bad or whatever make me into the friend or have let's have the relationship that we were supposed to have that's really deep that's really intentional let's have the marriage that you had intended for us so you want to jump in on any of that stuff that's good and just keep going um, restoration also has the meaning of um to resuscitate or to bring to life again so if you have a relation if you have something that needs to be brought to life again that means it is dead so um i just pray for each of us that may have broken relationships or something that um you know is not going well at the moment that that the holy spirit just breathes life on them again because that's what cpr does is you you know do the heart you breathe life and um, breathe into their mouth so that's what i'm asking the lord to do for those broken relationships that some of us may have or even the ones that are good already and they just need to be um, become vibrant again, that we breathe life into them with, let the Holy Spirit do that in us. And you were talking to me this morning or yesterday also about what part we play in it. Like we choose. Yeah, you, you have to, to, today can be your day of restoration. Today you choose restoration. You don't wait on another person. You do it. You, you open your heart. You become fully available you do the forgiving, you do the whatever you have to do to be, to begin restoration. It begins today. It may, you may not see it right away, but you start it today. Yeah, I will jump in real quick. Um, 
as we were driving down, it's kind of interesting. I'll, what I'm what I'm going to address is just the importance of the relationships because we honestly don't know, or I've never known. Maybe somebody does, but I have never known what the Lord had in mind. Mm-hmm. You might think you do, right? But years and years ago, we were talking because we're we're down here where Morningstar, you know, church was, and where we all got to know each other. And so as we're driving down, we're talking about that. And I said to Gina, you know, we, we have no idea how much our life has been influenced by the eight years we drove down here for church. And so the, the enormity of that, I couldn't even start to think about. But I said, just look at the relationships. And I started naming off people, most of who are on this Zoom call, that are so important in our life, you know, that, that live in this area. And, you know, like our closest friends and people we, we do everything with. And then I'm like, it just hit me. I'm like, you know, uh, I introduced a guy to Randy who I was introduced through Morningstar. He comes down, gets to meet Randy. Then he brings a team of, of kids from Mark's church to Ukraine. These kids come back, blow up Mark. And then Mark says, Hey, Randy, come up here. I need to talk to you. And then he goes to Ukraine. And the next thing you know, there's Koinonia happening in Pennsylvania. Now we have all these guys in Pennsylvania that we're so close to and and love so much. All because, like not because, but that one thing was we came here because it was obedience to the Spirit. As the Holy Spirit led us here and we followed that, and then he led us into relationship with, with, with us and you guys. And it just kept going. And, and he was doing all this. And we're just like, oh, great. We met somebody nice, you know, or somebody we like and enjoy being with. And, but the Lord was moving all the time. And so the, the koinonia between all of us just like have gone out. And like most of you guys on this Zoom call, have been included in that in some capacity. I don't even know how it all happened now, but there we are, you know? And so it's, I, I don't know, I just felt really strong today on the drive down about how important it was to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us in relationships and everything we do. It's just like, sometimes we leave that out. Just how important it is that, that the, we allow the Holy Spirit to literally take us into these places we need, because we really don't know. I never know what I'm doing. He's you know? got to show us. He's got to show us. Right. He's, he opens a door, and usually I just fall through it. Yeah. And <laughs> You do you it know, well. I do it well. I'm a good stumbler. So, <laughs> so yeah, that's that's just the discussion we had on the way down. So. One more thing I want to throw out, then we'll maybe just open it up for everybody else. Um, in uh, this, the scripture he gave me, you know, toward the end of the year was Second Kings eight six, and it's about Elijah when uh, he he's there in uh, well I'll I'll read it in just a second, but the the principle is that he restores us uh, back to where we would have been instead of where we think we should have been like a lot of times we think we've missed God and and maybe we did miss God or maybe we took a wrong turn or didn't take a wrong turn and there's a false expectation or there's something that there's an imposition that we put on our mind like I should have been farther along I used to do this so many times I should have been had more money had more success here or more whatever And, and the Lord's like stop beating yourself up and allow the supernatural part of the restoration to put you where I want you. That the original intent for your relationship, the original intent for your business, original intent that I had for your ministry, for everything else. And so even if we do go off, you know, it's one thing just that we were hearing about also, and he shows us in this verse is he doesn't take you back to the beginning of where you went off. Like in that scripture, where Elijah tells the lady that he restored her son to her, raised him from the dead. He said, you're going to sojourn for seven years. So by the word of the prophet, he, she leaves with her son, leaves her house, 
leave her, leaves her land and everything else. She didn't do anything wrong. She did everything right, actually. But she lost everything, kind of gave it all up. And so she comes back seven years later, and uh, Gehazi's in the presence of the king, you know, telling of, because the king asked, tell me the great things of Elijah and all this. And so she's telling the story. And then this lady walks in and she's like, there's the lady right there. And so then the king appoints somebody to restore everything to her, all the grain, all the harvest, all the land, everything, like she never left it. And we get this, you know, kind of a crazy thing in our head, like I went wrong, or even if we do something that the Lord is showing us, that we feel like we missed it when the Lord's like, listen, I hear it all is right here, just exactly where you should have been in the in the in the meantime so i was like we've got to have a totally different mindset from the lord's perspective like how we see people uh, instead of this conflict between what we actually see with our natural eye and then the supernatural part of it where we see this restoration already you know done so you guys want to jump in there Yeah, I'll add in, I like um, something you commented on earlier, Randy. You said, sometimes we don't know what our original value was. And, um, you know, a lot of times when you think of restoring something, you have a picture of what it, it gets restored to. And I think we have a picture of ourselves sometimes of like our best us. And so we try to restore back to this time we were stronger or smarter or richer. But is there really a a whole nother picture of us that we aren't aware of. And I was actually thinking of the power of the SOS sessions Mark does is I think, you know, that helps people see through um, the limits they put on themselves to who God really intended them to be. So <clears throat> that was just really impactful to me that do we, do we, you know, I even want to question, do I know my original value? And, and even in that, I think the power of when we gather in these quitting the events and we truly see each other and honor each other that even calls out more that you know we start to see the value in others which allows us to see it in ourselves which again is another powerful meeting for us to have these these meetings you know in times together um if i could jump in and tag right off of that um just wanted to see can you hear me all right, good. Uh, just tag off of that is that re you mentioned restore, and it may not be exactly what we we're thinking it's going to be. But um, for me, uh, I used to restore old hot rod cars. And when I was done with the cars, they were actually better than they ever were. And so, you know, when I think about restore, and I've been thinking about that word a lot in the last little while, what the Lord is doing. Um, we get in our mindset, a restore means take it back to this certain point and, uh, you know, redo. But when I restored cars, uh, they had better paint on them than they had from the factory. The interior was much more plush and better. Uh, I gave it more horsepower and the looks and the dynamics, the handling of the vehicle was better than it was originally. So I'm looking at what you're saying, Chuck, as, um, you know, this that we have never seen, maybe God's not just going to take us back. I believe he is reminding us of some things in this season, but I believe he's going to take us forward into what we've never seen before, what we've never heard or been before. And it's going to be better than new as it was when it was new. Agreed. Um, something that I've kind of been wrestling with is this idea that, um, I've heard some people preach this and it's, I don't feel like it's, it's the best way to describe what salvation is, is that what salvation does is it takes us back to what Adam had. And um, I actually, from the perspective of what he had in relationship with the father, I would say yes to that. But I actually think who you and I are, Larry, who Chuck and Randy and Steve, all of us are anyone else on this call. Uh, there's a scripture in the New Testament where it said that John the Baptist was the greatest of those of the old covenant, so to speak, but he was least in the kingdom of heaven. 
So you tie all that together, and I actually believe that this, this salvation that Jesus offers us, this restoration, because that's really what salvation means, it actually makes us better than not only we ever thought, but what God originally thought about. And I actually think it's better than Adam. Like, I think that who he is restoring us to, if John the Baptist was the greatest, but the least in the kingdom, like I'm, I'm blown away by the idea of what is possible because of the work of Jesus on the inside of us. At the same time, though, I think it has to be something that we're in full agreement with. I think that it's all available. I think it's something God wants so desperately, but we have to turn our heart and say, yes, I want it too. And then the full grace, the full measure of all God has is suddenly like instigated in our lives. The restoration process takes place. And then we are blown away by the fullness of what God has in mind. So much better than we could ever think, hope, or imagine. So I'm, I'm in with this big. Yeah, Adam didn't have a choice. We do. I think that, that goes along with what you're saying about partnering. There's something that really empowers, like we say, yes, I'm all in. You know, Adam, Adam was created in the image and likeness, like we are too, but we have that choice to go along with it. You, you even just said, yeah, Adam didn't have the opportunity to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to walk in the resurrection power of Jesus. You know, so I think that's, at least the way I see it, that's that's another level. That's that's a level of sonship. I don't think Adam knew. All right, there's a question that came from uh, one of the folks out there, Jody Goshorn one of our dear core um, and it's uh, restoration so far has been kind of talked about in the context of us as individuals or maybe in a interpersonal relationship. Uh, Jody's asking what does restoration look like in reference or context to the corporate body? Uh, my guess is she's talking about the fullness of the body of Christ. So uh, might be good for us uh, folks here on the panelists to maybe input on that. What does restoration look like for the corporate body? Well, I think obviously, um, you know, what we're here doing right now, I mean, koinia, um, I think that shared relationship that we have with one another um recognizing the that gift that's within each and every one of us that we bring to the table um i think there's a lot of the structure that the church has seen uh, throughout the world and throughout the years that quite honestly is not part of original design and i think it's important that we um, discover that so one of the things I really like about the season that we're in right now is that we're rediscovering church by not being together, as crazy as that sounds, because we're understanding the relational aspect of it. You know, we are uh, able to see one another for who we really are and what we mean in each other's life, even though we're not able to gather inside of a building. And so um, I think some of the restoration that needs to take place. Uh, because eventually we're going to phase out of what we're into right now, right? I mean, we've got all these different phases to get back to quote unquote normal. Uh, but I think there's certain aspects of what we're experiencing as the body right now that uh, quite honestly need to be phased in where we're going. And so recapturing uh, the true essence of relationship, seeing one another for who uh, we really are um, and learning to uh, just go in all in together. Um, I think that's a certain aspect of what we need to be uh, restoring. I, would, I wouldn't mind jumping in here for a second. Um, I hope you can hear me. But um, I, I'll tell you, I, I've learned, and I think these seasons are important because I, I don't know 
you may get really great revelation through the hardest seasons of your life because uh, you really start to, to, you know, just try to seek God, right? And try to really understand uh, who he is. I, I'll tell you what this looks like for original design to me. Um, I put this post out about my mom and her situation and what she's going through. And um, I asked for prayer. Um, and I noticed that um, anytime someone offered prayer, I never really vetted their like um, uh, their theology. Like I never sat there and was like, um, hey, could you tell me how you feel about uh, the rapture before you pray for my mom? Or hey, um, give me an idea of what you think about, you know, reconciliation and this before you pray for my mom. No, I was actually out there, I was like, I, like, I don't really care what you believe. Come over here and pray for my mom. And you over here, I don't really care what you believe. Okay, you know, and I know, like, I do care what you believe, but hey, we are in a time right now, get over here and let's become unified. Pray for my mom. Yeah, I don't really, like, shut up and pray for my mom. Like, that's how it was. Like, that's how it is, right? What do you think about hell? I don't give a crap. Come over here, like, and pray. And I think that's the, the, the original design was set up. There was like, we could push through those things and we could actually go um, uh, seek the father together. And like, remember like oneness, like this whole idea of oneness, this original design was, was all centered around oneness with Jesus that all those, like you could actually have that idea or that theology and somehow combine together it gives us the fullness of the of the concept of who God is, right? And you can believe this, and we can believe this, and we can have the whole spectrum in there and still be unified. And I think that's what this is pushing towards. And we may have needed a little bit of this crap going on in order to get us to the point where even, or me getting to the point where I'm like, I don't really care about your theology right here. Come be with me and let's seek out the Father because I have something that I'm really like my heart's after. So I, we can get caught up in a whole lot of stuff. Like and we do get caught up in a whole lot of stuff. And at the end of the day, the Lord, you know, I think the Lord just like, uh, where did that get you? Did it, did it get you and you to seek me together? Because if it didn't, it was probably, you know, you were probably dying on a hill that you never needed to die on, right? You never, like, <laughs> you're marching up a hill that I'm like, well, that's not my Calvary. Like, that's, that's something, that, that's a cross that you're carrying that has no, like, no power. Um, so that's kind of like, that's my thought about it, is, is that I'm, I'm actually willing and ready to surrender my hills in order to encounter the father with you where you're at, because that's actually the better experience than me convincing you of something um, that at the end of the day, didn't, you know, it was a hill of beans. So that, that's where my heart's at. And that's what I, I think about when you talk about this original design uh, question, Jody. Yeah. Yeah, I want to piggyback off that a little bit, if I may. Um, I've said multiple times throughout all this with some of the guys that I'm close to here that, that this may be one of the best things that's happened to the church in our lifetime. Now, and I know a lot of people don't feel that way, and, and I miss the connections, but it's it's – it's forcing us to rethink and it's forcing us to make phone calls, you know, and, and, and to people that, you know, prior to this, we had relationship with and we would talk to on a here and there basis. But, you know, now it's like, I want to FaceTime you. I don't want to just call you and I want to look at you because I can't be up next. I want to look at your face while we're doing this. And I think, um, you know, like, like Ben was saying with this group that I have here that I do so much stuff with, and I've said to them a million times that it was something um, pastor in Canada said that the real unity can bear the weight of disagreement. 
and that if we can learn that relationship is bigger than I don't have, I don't have a better way to say this other than the relationship's bigger than theology sometimes like it's it's important to have and through this whole process what I've been it's funny it's like uh I've had to go back to a lot of foundation stuff and maybe not like on my salvation but like I've went back and watched old videos about Kunani and I've went back and watched old videos about relationship and sonship and and that that we've done you know through um you know the Cornelius or the you know through who and videos you know I wa went back and watched all the identity videos that Mark and Randy and Steve did together and bringing us back to um I guess lay a better foundation and, and I hope I'm not bouncing around too much I'm trying to connect the dots in my head here but for me A lot of times Jesus is referred to as the last Adam and not the second one, but the last one. And that when we talk about being restored back and, you know, Mark was saying that he doesn't like when people talk about being restored back to the likes of Adam, it's because we're not, we're restored back to the likes of the last Adam, which is Jesus. We're going back to that. And from that, I can build, from that foundation, I can build so many things. It's funny because, you know, I, I, I'll get off on a tangent on theological stuff and run down this road, but eventually I have to come back and go, all right, where, where's Jesus in this? Because this is all well and good and fun to talk about and think about and read about. But if it's not centered around Jesus, I don't think it serves much of a purpose. And, um, when I think about the family and church being restored in this time, what I originally started saying is, is now we all have to go back to just Jesus, to just us and maybe our family and Jesus, or maybe just us and a friend and Jesus. And, you know, from this place, we can now begin to reassess what it is we build on top of. I, asked the Lord at the beginning of the year. Um, I actually, I asked the Lord toward at the end of our last Koinonia and I had this conversation with Mark about really wanting to be the person that, um, that I'm, I, I hate saying intended to be, but my heart was actually, I want to be the person that can carry the weight of the things that, Mark and Steve and Randy and Chuck that, that they've, they've built in this time frame that we've all been a part of Cornelia. I want to be, I've been asking the Lord to help me be the person that can shoulder that weight and help them carry it. And I know that's what sonship really is, but it, it was bigger than that to me. And, and I don't know how I'll explain that, but it's funny how, all the things that I've ran with that that's the Lord has just keep, keeps bringing me back to, all right, now focus on Jesus. Like, okay. <laughs> and and that, what that's done for me, it, it's helped me. It helps me read the Bible different because now I'm trying to focus on Jesus and not just focus on a theological point that I want to make. And it helps me focus on my relationships because like I said, if I'm really vested in unity, I can have disagreements and still see Jesus in that person and see Jesus in that moment and go, this is bigger than our disagreement right now. And I think for me going forward, rebuilding family or, or church or whatever you want to call it looks like Jesus and being restored back to looking more and more like Jesus. And that's not just, I used to think when I was a kid that that meant I, you know, like I had to talk like Jesus and act like Jesus. For me, that was like a mimicking thing. Like I had to be a parrot, but I'm learning more and more that 
the fullness of who he's designed me to be and being myself is an expression of Jesus because he's so um, a part of all of us. We're so made in his image that being fully ourselves is what releases him to a world that doesn't realize how good he is. Um, so I, I don't want to take up any more time, but I just feel like going back to Jesus is really where I'm at. And, and I get lost in too much other stuff. <laughs> I'm going to promote Kendall. He has something he'd like to say. I'll unmute. Hang on. You're unmuted. You're good. Okay. Hey, guys, can, I guess you can see me, hear me. Okay. Uh, thinking about this whole restoration thing, and I love it. It's just amazing. Uh, I want to I want to encourage us, though. Let's remember, uh, and I think we are, I'm sure we are, that this is a faith journey, and we've been called to walk together by faith and not by sight. And even when we see glimpses, I mean, you know, all of us have said, hey, the Lord has showed me this, and he really has. But uh, he showed us a part. Uh, it might be a huge part. It might, it's certainly a significant part, but it's not the total part. And so the thing that encourages me uh, from all just listening to everything that's been shared here is that I think we're being uh, like, I love what Caleb said about the last Adam. We're being restored to the last Adam, which is Jesus, who's the fullness of all and all. And, you know, that opportunity has been given to the church, us. We haven't arrived yet. So even, you know, we're seeing in part, uh, we're seeing in bigger parts, but we're restoring back to a unity. Uh, this is just me, guys, okay? A unity that really never was in manifestation, uh, if that makes sense. I, it's a unity. I think the restoration is back to, the design of seeing possibilities and the possibilities in relationships. And I think Jesus is like super excited about that because it's, it, you know, I don't understand all the, you know, certainly I don't understand details about how like, you know, he's united with his bride. His bride has made herself uh, ready. I don't understand that, but it, it, it uh, stirs and uh, just, uh, yeah, stirs this, this passion in me to walk out this faith journey, not by myself, but with you all and with, with everyone and with creation. So, yeah, it's a faith journey, and uh, we have the faith of Jesus. So thank you. Uh, Thank you guys and gals and I love you guys. And I'm excited about this. It's great. That's it. Hey, do you mind if I, I, I kind of want to um, add another thing. Oh, I guess I don't mind that you, if you'd mind. So um, I was thinking about something Larry said <clears throat> about restoring something to like that better, that better quality. Um, that wasn't free. Like Larry didn't, I mean, that, that cost, uh, that cost money. Like Larry decided to invest, um, <clears throat> into something that he saw needed investing in and then said, well, you know what, I'm going to put in greater than probably what was there. And then when I restore it, it's going to be worth something greater than what was there previously. Um, and I think we can change our, how we interact with people and our understanding of people when we stop valuing them for, you know, oh, this is their gifting or their talent or their this, this and that. And we start valuing people according to the price heaven paid for them. And the price heaven paid for them is the greatest price that could ever be paid for anything. Like this, it was beyond, I mean, the greatest gem and jewel and treasure of heaven was paid for
for that person. So now I have to actually value them according to that price and not on the price that I see with my eyes, which is really like, can really sometimes be carnal and really like covered with the flesh and actually sometimes can be just, you know, well, lower than. And if I actually start, and if I do that, I'm, I'm really just devaluing people. And this is the really, this is really hard um, to do, but this is the maturity that the father um, is asking us to walk into is to start valuing people according to the price heaven paid, um, the, uh, the price the father paid and not the things that I see uh, with my eyes. I would like to jump in. Can you hear me? Yeah, good. Well, <clears throat> I'm happy to to say hi from Ukraine. Uh, I've been thinking about this restoration and uh, I started to check in the Bible about restoration and I found this Amos, I think it's Amos 9-11. That's how you say the word Am Amos, the book Amos with the prophet. Okay. So it says, I will restore David's fallen shelter. I will repair its broken walls and restore its ruins and will rebuild it as it used to be. What really touched my heart is that everyone can put his own name, not just David's shelter, but I believe that everyone now is in the process of restoration, his personal relationship with God, his personal relationship with his family, his personal relationship with his mom and dad, with his personal relationship with people in the church that he uh, that he is depending from, and uh, for us right now as a church, it is a very interesting time when we um, zoom every we try to zoom every evening and uh, see if everybody is doing okay, if someone needs money, if someone needs food. If someone needs uh, prayer or anything else, we also have created a, uh, we call it a, a mercy fund. So everybody who needs finances or who has over, um, over blessed and he can donate money to support those who don't have a job because it's so different. I mean, the quarantine time in America and in Ukraine, it's two different uh, situations. In United States, it's one thing. In uh, countries like with a low economy, it's um, very close to starving time. The place when people need food, need help. And, um, and I see people in my church that need some, you know, some more than just a prayer. And restoration for our church is to be uh, to be whom we meant to be, not just a prayer, not just a Bible verses, not just a worship time, you know, using guitar or using something else. It's being a family in fullness, in, in full understanding of what family means, in um, calling one another. Um, Praying hard if something is wrong. The 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 medical system in Ukraine and and in United States is totally different. And Randy knows he been to Ukraine and all of you you know you've been to Ukraine. Uh, it's it's like if you get to Ukrainian hospital, this is not a restoration. <laughs> this is a really time. to pray yes yes Neil. you need to like you need to to cross you need to cross yourself many times and ask lord to heal you immediately because otherwise nobody will help you <laughs> so uh the the restoration here is faith love and i would say love more loving one another restoring taking care of one another this is how i feel it and um, I haven't used my English so long, so I have to, to pause myself to think and then translate it to English. Um, so it's also restoring my English. 
Yeah. So I I checked what the the restoration how we translate the restoration word in Russian and what that means in Russian and what that means in Ukrainian. Both of the uh, both of these words they say bring new to bring new bring you back to who you are and give you a new chance. So what I really believe that is for the whole family is bring us back to the to the basic understanding of what family, that family is uh, is love, is basically love. It's not built on love, it is love. And family is uh, two people loving one another, uh, getting in love, bringing new life, and uh, falling where love is driving them. So I believe that Lord is saying to 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 me personally and to to uh, our church is being love in every single action and check your motivations if they are love indeed if not they need to be restored to the point where love is. Thank you, God. So what were you going to say, Randy? <laughs> well, there were a couple of things I was writing down while you guys were talking. Um, it seems to me like this separation, you know, isolation has caused us all to look at everything so differently. Maybe place value back where it's supposed to be. I love, you know me, I love gathering. I, I love getting together with people and hugging and all that stuff. And it's caused, you know, a lot of us to see more by the spirit than we ever have, whether it was good or bad, because you can't like, like physically touch people, even though we're still working every day and we're just being cautious. We're not living by fear, but it's been amazing. Um, even in this really hard season that I personally have been through the last, you know, number of months where the Lord was like, I, you just keep doing what I have told you to do. And uh, like when we release peace to somebody, I've heard a lot of prophetic teachers say, well, if you, you know, know the enemy's plans to prophesy the opposite, and I don't really agree with that, I'd say, that the Lord's plans are usually the opposite of the enemy, but we're to speak what the what the Lord's heart is for that person. Instead of just saying, you're in fear, well, you need peace. That's, that's kind of obvious, but the thing is, if we know what the Lord's intent is and we speak it out or we just release it, it gives so much more life. It's not just the opposite of bad. And so it actually has this restorative property of the supernatural to bring peace instead of like yeah that's right it didn't do me any good but to really hear what the spirit of the lord is saying right now and then release it to people and i've noticed that the lord has been giving me dreams three to four times a night pretty significant dreams uh either for myself or for other people and i'll have to you know wake up and record them and then the next day or week or whatever i'll have to give it to them and it's uh, it's there have been so many restorative dreams about you know bringing people's identity back to them and bringing them out of the place that they are bringing me out of the place i was and getting me to like realize you're thinking just really poorly right now and um so it's it's been an interesting time. I don't think it's all bad, even though a lot of crazy stuff has happened. 
you know, I've been trying to encourage people use this time to don't just waste it, just, you know, staying at home and sitting at home, even though you're at home, like use it, use it to get to know the Lord more. And I mean, Zoom is great. Don't take me wrong, but don't depend on Zoom only to communicate with people. Like he tells us to know men and women by the spirit, not by Zoom. Zoom is great, but we're to know people by the spirit. And, and then when we pray for people now, it's so much easier just to be with you and see physically how you're doing and then tune into the spirit. But it's so much harder normally when you're, you know, a thousand miles away, like the guys in South Africa, many thousands of miles away. We know them by the spirit, not just by, you know, WhatsApp. Um, and we can, can know each other by the spirit and be thinking of one another. I go, I know somebody's thinking about me right now. And I can just, you know, tune into what the Lord is saying about that person and then just give it to them. So, anyway. What else you got there? Anything? Gina? Gina's quiet. These women are quiet today. I don't know if uh, the message, there was a chat message on here from a Freedom Reese. I'm not sure if that's Freedom, the Freedom we know in Florida. I'm not sure if Freedom Reese is, but she had a good thought on restoration as it related to our current circumstances. Is she able to get live and share that? Oh, that's your middle name. Oh, we learned something new about you today. Hey, Freedom, could you, could you someone get free on the microphone so she could share that? Yeah, give me one second. Okay. Here you go, Freedom. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, I just, that's one of the things I have been feeling the Lord speak to my heart, like during all this alone time at our house uh, <laughs> is just, it really is bringing to the forefront, not just, you know, in the obvious ways, the essential versus non-essential, you know, workers and whatnot. But I hope, and I feel that it's also having that effect on the church, um, that there's a lot of fluff. There's a lot of things that has been added maybe to get attention or to appeal to a certain type of person or, you know, whatever. And it's sometimes, and I'm not talking about us or any church in particular, but I'm just saying, you know, I feel like that this new normal can apply to churches in that we're going to, we're really are seeing what's essential in church and as a church, um, such as unity and family and feeling the distance between each other and realizing, oh, when I used to go, we just walk in the door and say hi and go home. And that's not real closeness. That's not real unity. Um, but yet, oh, the band was really good this week or whatever. You know what I'm saying? So I'm not dis ditching or dissing anything, but I'm just saying what was, what's really essential that makes a church a church. Um, and so I just, I hope that that's something, and I feel that that's something at least around here that people have been say, saying, you know, in church leadership and stuff like that. Yeah, thank you. That's really good. Um, I hope a lot of pastors, leaders, just people in general are kind of re-looking at what we have called church I mean, this is our opportunity. If we want to rewrite anything, if we want to start something different, if we want to institute something new that's been on our heart for a long time, this is the time. If we want to lay aside things that have not been producing fruit, not just in the church, but in our lives, this is the time. Um, if we do this current time that we're in right, we'll come out of this thing lighter, more streamlined, greater vision, 
fully engaged on that which is like really important like what is uh when jesus said to uh, martha that mary's doing the needful thing um there's something in this time for us to be able to say i can let that go and lay both hands on this versus one hand here one hand here so um i'm praying that for the church as a whole i'm praying that for us as individuals businesses uh, families, um, all of us probably need to let go of some things and then re-engage certain things with greater force, uh, multiplied energy. So that's really good. Thank you, Freedom. Uh, there was a question that I saw. Give me just a second. From Cassie. Thank you, Cassie. Good to hear you. Um, Cassie, did you want to ask the question? like verbally, or do you just want us to go off the chat? What's your preference? I think it would be good for us to hear her voice if she could ask it. One moment. Cassie, can you unmute your mic? Hello? Um, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, cool. I was just thinking, like, we we're talking about all this restoration, and it's just like we didn't really start about like talk about the where it begins. So, like, not just in me, but like, where do we begin our restoration in relationships? Where do we begin our restoration in ourselves, in our corporate, like, basically just the start. And that's pretty much it. Stay unmuted for a second. Um, could you re-ask the question again? <laughs> I want to make sure we hear it accurately. Okay. Um, I was just asking, like, where we begin our restoration. Hmm. That's the simple way I can ask it. Okay. All right. I'll go if you're not going to. Go ahead. Um, so for me, a couple of things are just going on in my life right now that mimic what we're talking about. A, um, back a couple of months ago, I started just eating better and working out. And if anybody's ever worked out, you know, like you do it. And then like a day later, you're sore. And then, like two days later, you're really sore because you tear that muscle down first before it gets rebuilt. And if those of you who've been following, you know, Maggie and I, the last week, we've been like restoring our deck and we've been tearing it down first. Um, what that looks like for me is, is, First of all, like tearing down anything that stands in the way of being able to clearly see the Lord, because that is where we're going to have to, any, anything that gets rebuilt, restored, remade in our lives, whether it be us, relationships, church, it starts with getting rid of the stuff that stands in between us and seeing the Lord. Um, how we should. And so uh, even at the expense of uh, doctrines or beliefs and stuff we have, I know it sounds contradictory to what I was saying earlier a little bit, because I do think that theology is important because 
anytime you talk about God or think about God, you're doing theology because that's what it is. So we have to kind of, I love where Steve's been here lately, where he's, you know, every time I hear him talk here lately, he's like revisiting so much stuff from, you know, where the church started and what is it they believed and what they thought because we, we start from there about removing blinders of seeing who the Lord really is. Because when we remove that, or we remove the stuff in our lives for us seeing who we really are, or we start removing stuff like offenses or just opinions we have about people, we can then restore relationships back to what they should be that we can restore ourselves to what we should be we can but it all starts with with removing the things we see about the lord um and i'll i'll go one step further and say what does kind of go back to what i said before is is the lord looks like jesus and steve talked about this on wednesday and if you guys hadn't watched that with who you need to go back and watch that because there has been years and years of thinking that God and, and Jesus were two different personalities. And the spirit was, uh, you know, the spook over in the corner that came around those who weren't afraid of ghosts. You know, it's just like we had these dichotomies of people in the father, son, and spirit. And it's like, they're one, they're together. They're, they're, their attitudes and demeanors all look the same. They all look like Jesus. That was what, uh, what Hebrew says is that he was the perfect image, the exact replication of who the father was. So I start looking at Jesus and, then the stuff that I have built that doesn't look like him, I've got to pull back down. And that's the stuff most of the time that stands in the way of relationships anyway. It's, it's not really, I, I'm not saying every case, but it's not always about what that person is or what they do, but it's what I project on them that keeps me from actually spending time or buying into the relationship with people. So for me, restoration starts with tearing things down was when 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 uh larry was talking about cars you got to get rid of the old paint before you can put new paint on it you got to get rid of the old stuff that doesn't work anymore before you can put the new stuff that does would make it stronger or faster or more comfortable in it and so point number one to answer the question would be what are the things that stand between you and how to rightfully see Jesus. And then what are the things that stand between you and rightfully seeing yourself the way Jesus sees you? And then what are the things that stand between you and how you're supposed to see others? So I hope that answers the question. I'd like to jump in. Um, I think it's um, got a lot to do with how far back do we want to go in restoration? You know, I've had people that brought, you know, me stuff and said I want you to restore this and their idea of restoration and my idea of restoration may be two different things they want to go back so far but do you really want to strip it all the way back down to bare metal or back to the original wood look uh, do you want to do that and a lot of people don't want to pay the price to go all the way back they just want to say well let's just do this and let's cover this up and cover that up and that's how we got to where we have been recently in the church is that, you know, full restoration, full salvation is taking it back to what you just said, Jesus. It's not taking it back to a church denomination or taking it back to a membership or taking it back even to Adam. If we want to go back um, to that far back, we want to go back to, I, I see it like this. I want to know what God was thinking when he created Adam and he's laying there with no breath in him and no life in him. 
at that moment, that's the restored part I want to go back to. I don't want to go back to after Adam has it inside of him, has that life, and then he decides, you know, what he does. I want to know what God's original intent was for me, for mankind. And that's taking it all the way back down, so to speak, to the metal and back to the original look that maybe we were supposed to have had. But I want to just jump in with Mark here and say that I'm in total agreement here that uh, I believe that this is a divine opportunity for a reset for our nation. I believe it's a reset for the church, and I believe it's reset for families. I've saw people having family activities <laughs> out of necessity uh, that hasn't had any in quite some time, and I'm starting to see people all around me that say, this is good. I like this. They're enjoying their family time, sitting around the fires and sitting around talking to each other, sitting on their porch. They're actually starting to see the value that they've been missing. And I think as far as church goes, I think this has been one of the best things that's ever happened to the church. A lot of preachers, pastors are terrified in this moment. Their anxiety levels are out the roof because they can't figure out how to get people back in the building so we can get some money back in the offering place so we can pay for these buildings that we've went in debt for that we said the Lord told us to get and the Lord really didn't have a lot, a lot to do with it. We just wanted a big ministry so we ended up with a big building. So now we got to, we were scared. What are we going to do? But I think it's one of the best things that's ever happened because it's brought us back to reality that we, the body of Christ, the people are truly his body. It's not, it's not the building. We appreciate our buildings. We appreciate our facilities, but this has brought us back to the basics that it's not a light and fog and smoke show. It's back to what you've been saying, Caleb, it's back to Jesus. It's back to him because he is, he is the answer to it all right now. And I think there is a reset. I think it's, I think this is something, you know, the question is, did the Lord cause this? Is this a judgment of the Lord? Is this the, I think, you know, the Lord didn't cause this, but I think he will use this, turn it around for good and cause us to uh, really, I think he'll, he'll, he'll cause this to be a good thing for us. I think there'll be growth from it. I think there'll be uh, a lot of reality that'll come into to play. And in this season, I've been resting. That's what, you know, the part of the word restoration is rest. And I've been very peaceful in this and had a lot of rest in this in the Lord. Now, Tammy has kept me busy working around the house, a lot of projects. So I'm ready to go back to, you know, but as far as the rest in my spirit and my mind, I'm very peaceful. I'm very excited about what the Lord is doing in this. And I, I really, to be honest with you, uh, is, this is a time when if you want to hear the Lord speak, you can hear him right now. And if you really want to hear him, you got to hear in here. You can, you can do that right now. Uh, I, he just overwhelms me sometimes with his presence. I'll just be sitting in a room or doing something out in the shop. And all of a sudden, I find myself bursting out in tears as the presence of the Lord just coming on me. So uh, forgive me for saying this, but this is a good season for a lot of people right now to really come back to basics and and the lord is re very real he's close to us at this moment it's times like this people think the lord is far away but no it's right now it's right now when he's really really close <clears throat> hey um i really i i really um appreciate all the responses to this um but i want to give a little bit of a different perspective on it um, if, if nobody minds and I'm, um, uh, not to come against or oppose, but when I think of that question, where does my restoration start? Um, I have to then ask a corresponding question of where does my restoration end? Um, and that, then that gets really problematic for people because they're like, Ooh, here I am. And the end is all the way over there. So you know what? Uh, I'm actually good. <laughs> I don't want to have to go through all those steps for restoration because, man, that end point just seems a lot really far out. Or, you know what? It seems like a lot of work. So, you I, forget it. I, I would encourage us to shift the question a little bit to um, 
uh, in whom is my restoration made complete? Because if I ask that question, uh, then you're going to find that the beginning and the end is the same place, right? So like I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. So you're going to start, here's my, the, the completion of my restoration and the start of my restoration. And it's right here in the same place. And if I can actually rest in the same place, then you're going to find that you'll get to the restoration point a lot quicker than if you ask the question, hey, where does it start and where's it end? And where are all the stops that I have to make in the middle? And that doesn't mean that you're not going to have to do some things. You're definitely going to have to do some things, but doing it in him is way much easier than doing it in my strength, right? Which, which and actually this is, this is where we get sourced wrong and we, where we get churched is now I have to go to Mark to tell me where my restoration starts. And then he's going to give me all these toll gates and say, oh, you know what? Okay, you're good here and you're good here and you're good here. And now, hey, your restoration is done. When my restoration is really actually continuing and it's going into this cycle of like, oh, it's, it's actually elevating into this greater understanding of who, who God is. So for the church, let's ask a different question. Not that the question is bad, but the, 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 the elevated question is, or when you get to that point where you're asking, where does my restoration start? Let's get to source and say, no, where is my restoration made complete? In whom is my restoration made complete? And now you actually have more assurances because you know the promise that he made will be brought to through completion because he's doing a good work in you and he's promised to complete it. So, um, yeah, I, I encourage you to move towards that direction and asking a different question. So let me jump in here real quick because um, I, I really like what Ben's talking about. It, it kind of reminds me of um, Avengers Endgame. And, uh, you know, when Doctor Strange goes through all the scenarios, he comes to the one scenario that really works out, and that's why it's called the end game. And I think if the end game here, scripture says that we are being conformed to the image of Christ, then what we're actually, um, you know, what we're starting from is not where we lack, but where we're supposed to be going or becoming. And uh, so I was thinking about Ephesians 4 earlier when it talks about how we are to, um, you know, basically take off or put off the former self our former manner of life, all of the things that we learned, everything that we created outside of relationship with the Lord, and we begin to renew our minds in the spirit of uh, Christ, because I feel like that's, you know, when we talk about where are we, you know, what are we starting at, um, you know, that's, 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 I think, crucial uh, for each and every one of us. So to go back, I love what Larry said. You know, if I go back to when, when God created Adam and he's laying there before he breathes the breath of life into him, what is in the heart of the Father? Because I really believe that for each and every one of us, there was that moment where the Lord brooded over us. I'm not froze. I'm just taking this in, Maddie. I think he brooded over us and said, this is my heart for Caleb. This is my heart for Randy. This is my heart for Ben. This is my heart for Chuck or whoever he's talking about. This is my heart for them. And he breathes into us that very life that we would walk in, that we would become the very thing that is in his heart. And I think for us, the restoration process, you know, is, is it's just going to the Lord and discovering that for each and every one of us. Like it's it's I don't want this to become a generalized thing, like, oh, what was this for humanity? I mean, that's great. I mean, we can talk about a lot of stuff for humanity, but what does that mean for Randy Strumback? You know, to go back to the creative intention of the Father. What does that look like when he steps into that? You know, what does that look like for Sergei, where he lives and what he's going through to step into the creative purpose of God? What does that look like for Jody? What does that look like for freedom? I mean, for every person that we're, we're talking to, 
that I mean, what does that look like? And I think for for all of us, it just means we've got to take some time and really ask the Lord, what was your heart for me? And what were you thinking? You know, I remember I remember going to a Jesus culture uh, conference several years ago and, you know, Kim Walker Smith talking about how she would never ask the Lord what he was thinking of her when he created her because she didn't want to know the answer. And a lot of that is just the stinking thinking that we bring into uh, this relationship. And uh, she shared the entire story. And uh, it's amazing what happens when we step into the Father's heart for us. And so that would be my encouragement. Where do we start? I think we start with the end game in mind. I think we start with what does it look like for me to be the image of Christ? What does that actually look like? What does that sound like? And what are my relationships like? And what is my role in the thing of church and church life? What does that look like? Because um, I think this is really important. If we have the end game in mind, it will definitely change the way that we uh, step into what we need to step into in the moment. Hey, Renee had a, a thought there on the chat. It might be good for him to share. Maddie, could you bring Renee up? Thank you, uh, Caleb and Larry and Neil and Ben for sharing those answers for Cassie. I think they were really heartfelt and that's a lot for her to chew on, so thank you. Can we bring Renee up? Yeah, he's on. Just unmute your mic, Renee. Hey, greetings from Costa Rica, guys. <clears throat> hey, Renee. Hey, we are so happy to see you. And thank you for putting this up together. I just wanted to, to share what uh, I wrote uh, in the chat. And it's basically that we have been speaking about restoration. But I, I think that maybe not everybody, but it happens in my case that sometimes we postpone the work of, of getting to where God is telling us to go or or just going to the point of restoration because we have to deal with all the trash, all the rubber. Uh, I remember the story of, of <clears throat> Ben sharing when he was doing some restoration in his home and, and bringing down some, some walls and all of that mess that he ended up with. And it was kind of funny hearing the story, but uh, when you are there, it's not funny. It's just like being in the middle of all the rubber, trash, and, and everything is nasty. And that's why sometimes we don't want to deal with that. So in the personal level, I think uh, that's the challenge uh, that we, we have to, to make ourselves available for restoration, but we gotta know that we gotta deal with all the trash. And second, now that uh, uh, I hear Larry sharing like how some ministers are feeling, I know that a lot of people don't, they wanna go back to the old normal in church, the old normal in everything, because they don't wanna deal with change. And they are gonna try, and they are gonna try hard, and they are gonna fail because People, after this, they are going to be changed. They are going to be thinking different. They are going to start looking for something more real in church. And these people that they want to keep on doing the same stuff are going to be frustrated. And I think that's what happened with ourselves when we try to just keep being what we are and avoiding restoration. It just is going to just make things work for us. But I think we have to make ourselves available for change in for restoration but that's a hard process and we gotta face that before we we gotta we gotta put our our work closed before we start asking for restoration love you guys yeah that's not just you renee 
And I can tell you that's all of us. When we turn our hearts to the Lord, one of the things we see is not only do we see ourselves as we are, but we also see everything that's covering who we are. And that covering right away reminds us of work, reminds us of pain, reminds us of effort that we're going to have to put in and endure in order for that restoration process to take place. You know, what Larry didn't talk a whole lot about was all the work that goes into restoring those cars to a better version of where they were. And so uh, I think you're absolutely right. That's not just for you. All of that stuff that we're going to have to go through in order for the fullness of who we are to be revealed and to be restored to the image of Jesus, that's work. That's pain. And we're all facing that. In some area of our life, some relationship, we're facing that. So, Renee, you're right on. Thanks. Maddie, was there anybody else that had something they wanted to share or add? Not yet. I don't see anything yet. Okay. Um, for this last little bit here that we're together, um, I don't think this should go too much longer. Um, I thought it might be good for some of us that are on this call to maybe share some insights you're getting from the Lord specifically, if you haven't already. Some of you have already kind of shared some things the Lord showed you during this time we've been kind of quarantined, isolated. Um, but I was just curious if any of us haven't yet, maybe want to share a couple of things the Lord has shown you during this time or things you've directed your heart toward that's helping you kind of prepare yourself for when things reopen again and things, yeah, reopen. I think that's a good word because we're not sure what it's going to actually look like when we go back to life. Um, so any of you guys or gals have anything you want to share as far as what the Lord's showing you, what you're working towards, some of the things you're praying, reading, doing, that's getting us into a place where the future truly is something you're looking forward to. I want to jump in. Uh, I thank Steve when we had Zoom with Steve. He was sharing a little bit about, oh man, I really don't know English names for these guys in Bible. I think it's that. We call, we call her Esther, but I think it's uh, so the lady who, who, who married uh, uh, the king. I think it's that. So the, the basic idea. After, okay. 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 Sorry, I still don't remember all the names in English and, and Russian. They are different. So the basic idea was when Mordecai came and he said, that, "Well, you have to go to the king," and she was scared to death. I mean, she was just like, "No, no, no! I'm not going there, and I'm not going to talk about Israel and everything like that." And then, and Steve said. I think this was Steve. I think Steve was you. Sorry if it wasn't you, but I think it was you. And you said, think if you were prepared for such a time like this. So I do believe that kind of near and relationship that we have been developing for more than 10 years, they are right now to save church. I mean, not a church just like an institution, but I mean church like a body of Christ. This is the only, uh, the only thing that I, uh, that I uh, honor that we have relationship and we can call one another and we can talk with one another, we can share things. What I also found that some of the temptations came up and they are trying to, for example, just, you know, uh, when you see your kids not doing homework right and and during this quarantine time in Ukraine, you have to be a, a, a medical assistant, a teacher, um, a driver, for example, to just to drive and buy food. So you have to learn things that you, that you usually direct to your wife or direct to someone else. I mean, the teacher is responsible for my kids, not me. The, um, 
the doctors they are responsible for the health of my kids but not me and now you're responsible for everything in the world that you can be responsible for even for sanitizer at home i mean for everything and the only thing that gives you hope to go through this time relationship that you can call someone and say hey i'm sick of it i am so tired of it that i hate my my everything and um, i'm not sure if this has happened in in in, in the united states uh, but i've been reading to what mark wrote on facebook for those who are in a difficult family environment then you need to remember these words thank you i'm so proud of you and and blah 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 yes those are the words that you need to remember to speak <laughs> to keep relationship alive to save relationship alive and um not um about two days ago uh everybody from my family that went to sleep and i couldn't uh, i couldn't get to sleep i just i don't know what happened I, usually i fell asleep pretty early i'm the early bird and i couldn't and you know a lot of temptations came again and i'm like I remember these temptations 11, 20, 12 years ago. They never would show up. And they came. And I started to think, well, whom I can call to talk about that? That at least we can, we can work these things out. We can talk. We can pray. And the only thing that surprised me that I didn't want to, uh, to call someone who has authority. I wanted to call someone who has a relationship with me. And this is very different to have relationship. So I do believe that the Lord is saying to all of us, you've been doing right for, for, for paying your attention to relationship more than to institutional church. And I believe that relationship right now is a very, um, like what, what uh, Steve said, that you've been prepared for such a time like this that Kainania was prepared as well for such a time as this, to have fellowship and relationship and to keep us safe. And then... Well, I can share what I've been thinking about <clears throat> over the past few weeks and um for this week the the verse the that was on my heart from the lord is in second timothy where he says be ready in and out of season and i think you know when you're hit with a crisis you can see the cracks in yourself um you can see where your weaknesses are they sort of get uh magnified versus in good times you don't tend to uh see those just as well because things are good so you know, as some examples, different areas that come to me are financially, health-wise, and spiritually, and there's a lot more. But so, you know, where did I fear for my provision when things started going bad? And, um, you know, financially, you know, so what do I want to be ready for the next time something comes around? And I think the season really highlights those to you. Um, health-wise, like, okay, you know, you're hearing of people with health issues are more susceptible, so where can I be more prepared the next time around? Uh, where can I be ready for this? Spiritually, like, if you're not strong out of season and you hit something like this and now you start crying to the Lord, well, have, you, have I been crying enough to the Lord when times are good to be ready for the bad times? So um, in this season, I think it really calls for for me, what I'm seeing is you know, what areas of my foundation need shored up, um, not in a condemnation way, but in a way that actually gets me excited to be, I think someone said this earlier, how am I going to propel out of this into the future to, uh, to do better things? So I'm trying to examine in me what those things are. And this, this uh, verse to always be ready, you know, is really a call because I think we want to be the light to people who in a pandemic situation need hope. And if we are prepared ourselves because we haven't put in the work or um, just been continually improving ourselves, we're not going to be as ready as we could. And I think this just is a, 
season that really can highlight in our lives where we can be uh, more ready and prepared. So, you know, I guess my encouragement is to examine yourself in those areas and, you know, let, let it shine, you know, let the light shine in areas of you that uh, you can strengthen and, and reach out to people that you might see that have strength in those areas and, and try to grow and um, be more prepared in the future for that. Any other guys have any thoughts? This might be a little different. Um, uh, the Lord's been challenging me to see opportunities in this kind of crazy season, um, especially in the business realm. One of the things Corey is, is we were talking about is like restoring our dreams back to us. But well, you want to go right ahead. Um, well, what were some of the things that you listed out when you were talking about the dreams being restored to us? Like, not you remember? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things when the Lord was showing me about opportunities, I had a call yesterday at, at my construction office, and um, I'm building a, an enormous house for a friend of mine. We're just getting ready, to, we're actually broken ground on it. While everybody's, you know, shrinking back and trying to conserve and all this other stuff, and I, I haven't, you know, we've had a lot of our business deferred, a lot of our business deferred down the road, but the, the Lord's like, okay, you don't need to panic about that. I'm going to bring in all kinds of business in this crazy time. I'm like, all right. And so I get a call yesterday. It's like one of the other builders out where we build a lot has told people, we're not taking any more new business. I'm like, send them my way. And that's, that's what the guy said. I sent them your way. And so it's another huge house. I'm like, we'll take it. And so we're actually looking for not just business opportunities, but the perspective of the Lord's like, you can turn around so much stuff just by the way you think now, instead of thinking in fear or thinking in lack like, where's, where's my next job coming from? Like, I'm not worried about where my next job comes from. I'm going to focus, like for these guys have been talking about, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on, you know, the Lord and all these things he's been showing us all these years and years and years, and now's the time to put into practice what we've actually been learning. Like, walking in our identity, walking in the DNA of the Lord that he put in us when he like, like Larry was saying, when he breathed life into us, starts, it's, it's actually time to be encouraged and walk in that stuff. Not walk in fear, but walk in faith. And it's not, you know, some little platitude, but like know who you are and just walk in who you are. And it's amazing how it's, it's attracted to you. All these things we're talking about, they literally just are attracted to some something so different is like you're not afraid no i'm not afraid um we're not worried about going bankrupt and i know a lot of people are right now but as sons we need to take courage and just stand in who we are and really start to you know live the stuff we talked about for all these years and like Mark even started out before any of us started talking about it's it's you know the things that the Lord showed us and the Lord did through Ukraine and through Pennsylvania and all that stuff is not over. It will definitely change and it's been in the process of changing, but it's gonna be so much greater, <laughs> so much better if we continue to see and or even try to see through the vision of the Lord, try to see through the eyes of the Lord, what his perspective on everything is i think he was telling so many pastors and leaders around the world these very <clears> things <throat> that he's been saying now but it's they're having to like cluster themselves and not be caught in the trappings of what they thought um like church life was like the structural part of it 
and they're like, wow, he's really real. And he's so alive, you know, and with all the death and all the stuff going on around, it's just been really a different way of thinking about everything. So. Randy, I'd like to jump, jump in with that. When you said opportunities, I, I was sitting here debating the scripture that I'd had before we came on. Um, and I'm going to read it in just a moment, but I've been talking with a lot of pastors in different areas right now. And for the last few weeks, uh, some of it's got better, but the first, when this first happened and after a couple of three weeks, they were literally in so much fear and anxiety, uh, over this and what they're going to do. Um, because their, their mindset was where I was a few years ago in religion and church. Uh, versus relationship with the Lord and being a son. Um, but I, I, when you said opportunities, I just, I just smiled because that was the scripture I was reading in James, uh, James chapter one. And what it talked, I believe this speaks directly to us in this season. And it says, uh, James chapter one and verse two, I'm reading in the Passion Translation says, my fellow believers, when it seems as though you are facing nothing but difficulties, see it as an invaluable opportunity to experience the greatest joy that you can. And then the very next verse says, for you know that when your faith is tested, it stirs up power within you to endure all things. And then verse four, and then as your endurance grows even stronger, it will release perfection into every part of your being until there is nothing missing and nothing lacking. And so there is everything that we're talking about. This is a great time for opportunities for us to, to look around us to see things that God can use to grow us into the next season of whatever's coming our way. And somebody asked me about our church and said, because we went through a, a very hard financial time, and so most of you on here know what we went through. Uh, this has been a good season for us. Uh, even right in the middle of this, the bills are paid, the mortgage has been paid. Uh, the Lord has just moved miraculously through people giving. And, um, you know, it's, 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 it's an amazing time, but I don't want to see us bow down in fear and anxiety. I want us to rise up in faith and believe that, as you said, the, the life we proclaim that we, we have, the faith we say we have in Jesus, well, now we got an opportunity to show that faith and to uh, experience his, his, his power in the middle of this season. I really believe that with all my heart, that the Lord wants to show himself very powerful through us as his sons and daughters right now. And we don't need to back down and, and shut, shut down. We need to come alive in this season and be light and darkness and be help uh, and hope to people that feel helpless at this moment. Thank you. I agree. Um, this might sound a little counterintuitive to some of the things that we've shared today, but I, the Lord's actually stressed on me not so much change, but what shouldn't change. That there are things that we are, we were involved in before that we better make sure we're still involved in after this that there are things we were seeing through, then this happened and it kind of got put on hold, that we better start seeing it through as soon as this thing opens up again. Um, I actually feel the Lord like really heavy on what I'm saying here, that we need to remain faithful in the things the Lord has given us prior to this happening. Some of us might feel tempted to take the opportunity to bail <clears throat> on some things that were hard, before this started and the Lord is really strong <clears throat> telling me personally no, my spirit is just as willing then as it is now to help you finish what's been started so for any of you that are like hey this is my opportunity maybe I can go you know and let that thing go like I'm even hearing people saying like maybe they can walk away from their mortgages and some things like that I'm like that is that's the opposite of light. That's the opposite of power. That's the opposite of integrity. 
Um, I can walk away from this hard business thing. I can walk away from this hard church thing or this hard relationship thing. Hey, I haven't had to spend six weeks with that person. Now, what am I going to do? Maybe I'll just change so I don't have to go back. This has been such a great six weeks. I feel like the Lord's saying, no, if anything, what he's doing is he's restoring us inwardly to go attack with new fervor, new energy, new vision, new passion, the very thing we were doing before. What I have heard the Lord say to me is the vision doesn't change. Maybe the way you approach it does. And very, that is a, that's, that's, that's the key to being faithful and flexible at the same time to stay faithful to what the Lord created us to do faithful to what we've started like that verse from Psalm 30, 138, but also be flexible. Being flexible doesn't mean you change the vision, change where you're going, change what you're building. You might have to change how you're building. You might need to change what the course is that you're taking to get to that final destination. But I really want to encourage all of us, don't bail on the hard thing or don't bail on the thing that wasn't going well. And Hey, this is my opportunity to jump ship. Quite the opposite. I feel the Lord saying so strongly, hope you're enjoying this because this was your time to re-strategize, rethink about get a new plan so that you can attack that thing with full force and new vision, new purpose. So that's what I'm hearing. Um, finally, uh, Caleb, why don't you get on and share what you just showed me? Um, before I, before I run into that, I do want to back up what you're saying. When this all started, one of the first conversations Maggie and I had was, well, what should we, you know, what if this happens or that happens? And, you know, the, most of it was financial stuff. And she said, well, you know, the kids can't do this for a month. So why don't we not do it? And I said, no, I want to keep paying that because they'll find a way to teach them this or that or the other. And, um, and those businesses need us right now. And that was my take on it. Um, my gym, my, she was like, well, you can't go to the gym. Should you, you know, postpone your membership? And I said, no, I said, uh, I'm still going to work out. I'll figure it out. And when this is done, I'm going to go back to the gym. So why not continue to help and be there for them? Like they need us, like we need everything else around us too. So, I would, I would venture to say like, maybe it's a little bit of uh, a prophetic thing, but there is going to be a new normal and it's going to be like, instead of social distancing, it's going to be like social suffocation. Like I'm going to be in your face, loving you more than I ever have. Um, it's, it's not going to all the essential and non-essential. Yeah. The, the essentials are going to stand not as people, um and in work mode but you as a human being you're essential and i'm going to be right there walking this out with you same thing in business and life and that's why we made the decision no we're going to keep paying stuff that we're not doing because it was essential for me to not let this thing take everything like i'm not going to do that like i'm not going to do i, I believe that even though it's a business transaction, a membership fee, for me, it became a way of sowing seed and going, no, I'm going to keep sowing into this business. I'm going to keep sowing into these people. Even though I can't be there in that building right now, I'm going to keep my stake in the ground and go, no, I'm not giving this up. I'm not letting this go. And I think what you're saying, Mark, is, is dead on for people that are listening is, you need to maybe reevaluate things that you did let go because of this and jump back in it and go, no way. I'm not giving up on this. I'm going right back after this and start now. Don't wait till it's over. Like go back now and say, you know, we're going to do this. We're going to, we're going to move forward. Um, so to turn a little bit, what I really feel. Hey, one we, thought. Yep. Well, before you do that, Daya wanted to share something. So, I think what you're doing would be a good way to end this. So I want to have Daya okay. share before. You. Yep. Thanks. Hello, hello. 
Hey, you're good. You're good. Okay, cool. Just checking. Um, I just love you guys. This time has been so valuable to us to just see all of you connect with your hearts even more. Um, you're seeing your beautiful faces. And I uh, just wanted to share something the Lord's been putting on my heart. I mean, you all have been talking about a lot is um, just concept of home, the, the experience of home that we've had through Koinonia is something so real, so tangible that we've all felt, which, you know, has been such a, a power behind, um, behind everything that has come from that. And uh, I think what this time has been showing me is the importance of staying home, both literally and symbolically. I like to really take the literal of what's going on in the world and see the symbolism behind it. I think a lot of us have experienced home, but not enough of us have stayed home, if that makes sense. Because uh, honestly, as we've seen, home gets uncomfortable sometimes. Uh, you start seeing things that you didn't notice before, maybe the cracks on the wall, the the whatever it is, the stillness, a lot of us aren't good with being still, a lot of us aren't good with the work that comes from it, but um, just feel the Lord saying that when everything opens up, when everything, we go back to working the way we've known, all that, to just remember to stay home, um, and uh, really asking ourselves what that looks like, what does it look like to stay home while physically not staying home with being with people after this time of really assessing what's essential and what's not, because uh, it's not gonna look the way it did before. I love the topic on restoration, because home is where we start the day, it's where we end the day. But um, yeah, the real message I've been getting here is just stay home. Love you guys. Love you. That was good, thanks, Daya. All right, Caleb, go. So um, I felt like just kind of before we wrap this all up, um, I got this really, I think it was when Larry was talking about the Lord, like just breaking in and, you know, bringing you to tears and stuff. And I know Neil and I talked and he had a moment like that yesterday. <laughs> and um, I really felt like just taking a moment, or some moments and let just, uh, I feel it <laughs> just waiting in the presence of the Lord together and just letting him do something in us in this moment and in this time together and, uh, whether it's just to wait and experience his heart all together, and maybe even just a time to feel each other's heart in his presence together. I, I don't know what's going to happen right here. I don't really have a, any idea, but I just want to wait on the Lord because I think for maybe some of us, me even, I'll just put me in there. I've, forgot to just let the Lord be present and just feel his presence. So Jesus, we just, uh, we love you. <laughs> we just love you.
We honor your presence in our lives. Father, I just, uh, I bless our family all over the world. I can see so many faces in my heart, not just what's on the screen in front of me. And I just speak blessing. Lord, bless our brothers and our sisters, sons and daughters, fathers and mothers. Just bless you in Jesus' name that the weight of this presence that I feel would carry into your lives and that we would realize how loved we really are not just by the Lord, but by each other. I just bless each and every one of you today. I feel that just welling up inside of me. Just, I bless you. I bless each and every one of you today. I love you so much. And I feel the weight of the Father's love and his blessing upon us in this season to not retreat, but to move forward and to be better and to be fully restored. Jesus, we ask for that today for every person. Amen. Thank you, Caleb. That's pretty heavy. I feel it here. I'm sure they're feeling it there where they are, whoever they is. So any less words from any of you guys? I want to thank everybody that came on with us today. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you to the dads and moms who are on here today. It was really good to be with you and everyone that was here. We love you. I echo everything Caleb said. We bless you. We are really thankful for who you are and who we are together in him. 
And if we take anything away from our talk today, let's remember in our turning to Jesus, whether it's one time or over and over again, restoration immediately kicks in. So keep turning so that restoration, that fullness can happen in and through you and all of us. We love you guys. See you again soon. Love you all.